So hi everybody and welcome to Argonne National Laboratory's virtual field trip titled Vehicle Electrification. My name is Alex Mitchell. I work in communications here at the lab and uh, next to me is Ann Schlenker. She's the director of uh, Argonne Center for Transportation Research. Um, so in a minute um, Ann is going to talk a little bit about exactly what you'll see today on the field trip. Um, but before we do that we'd like to say hello to everybody that we have dialed in here. So in addition to Ann there are um, three uh, Argonne researchers that are dialed in. Uh, the first is uh, Lynn Trahey. Um, so say hi, Lynn. Hi, everybody. Uh, the second is uh, Chris Pupek. Hi, Hello. Chris. The third is Henning Losa Bush. Hey, guys. How's it going? And then we are also joined today by um, Carl Schurz High School in Chicago. Say hi, Schurz. Uh, Good, morning. Good morning. And then we are also joined finally um, live in the chat by uh, Niles North High School in Skokie, Illinois. Say hi, Niles North. So in addition to the, um, the classes that are tuned in with us, there are uh, several classes around the country that are dialed in. And we'd like to say a special hello to Maplewood Richmond Heights High School. And then in addition to the, the schools here in the U.S., there are actually several classrooms around the world that are dialed in. Um, and we'd also like to say a special hi to um, the Corona Secondary School in Ag Agbara, Nigeria. Um, so hello to our friends in uh, Nigeria. We look forward to them uh, submitting a question that we might be able to answer. So as I said, um, in a minute here, uh, um, Anne is going to talk about what exactly you'll see in the field trip today. But first, I'd like to just give some very basic information about Argonne. Um, Argonne National Laboratory is one of 17 uh, national laboratories under the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, we're just outside of Chicago, about 20 minutes down the road. Um, it's a big campus here. There's roughly 1,200 uh, engineers and scientists um, who work here on the lab. And what their mission is and what the mission is of all the national laboratories is to tackle some of the, the real grand challenges that face the U.S. and the world, whether it be energy, which is somewhat similar to what we'll talk about today, the environment. Um, there's research that's done on campus here that's uh, aimed at um, eradicating some major diseases, um, supercomputers, it really goes on and on. So if, if there's a, a major challenge that's facing the world, um, it, it's our, our mission to uh, try to address that. Um, so, um, and, and everybody who's dialed in, um, who's, who's watching um, the broadcast, um, feel free to uh, submit questions and, um, you know, depending on um, timing, we'll try to get to as many as we can. So um, without further ado, I will kick it over to Anne, and she will talk a little bit about what you're going to see today. Um, and uh, as I said, she's the director of Argonne Center for Transportation Research. And you also may recognize her as the person who um, introduced <laughs> President Obama when he visited the lab here in March. Um, he visited the lab to, uh, to give a speech about uh, U.S. energy policy and also to take a, a tour that's very similar to the uh, field trip that you're going to take today. So uh, take it away, Anne. So thanks, Alex, and, and thank you to everyone that's participating today on this virtual tour. It's exciting for us. It's actually the first time that we've conducted this, so I uh, look forward to, to more of these as we move forward. So our broad transportation research portfolio is really aimed to reduce petroleum consumption in transportation, to diversify our energy sources, and to reduce our environmental footprint from our cars and trucks that we all drive on the highway. When you stop and think that two-thirds of our petroleum used is really from the light duty and medium duty uh, transportation space. Not too long ago, maybe about a year ago, a billion dollars a day went out uh, from the U.S. Treasury for foreign oil. So we imported about a billion dollars a day. So rather than jobs here in the U.S., that money was shipped offshore. So we know that we want to uh, improve fuel efficiency and in fact, uh, not too long ago, there was a, a new regulation put in place to double vehicle fuel economy by 2025. So when you stop and think um, about a two-fold increase in fuel economy, it's really a revolutionary change in transportation from the light duty space. So with that, Certainly a lot of efficiency is going to be necessary, so engines and transmissions uh, that you all know and love for gasoline and diesel engines, but light weighting material uh, will come to play. And another part of that solution set is going to be vehicle electrification. So that's really what we're here to talk about today, from hybrids to plug-in hybrids to battery electric vehicles or fuel cells as we progress along that path for vehicle electrification. So we all start with batteries. 
and battery technology as soon as we move towards vehicle electrification. So with that, we're going to bring up Lynn Trahey, and uh, she will speak to us about uh, battery and battery chemistries. Take it away, Lynn. All right, thank you, Anne. Thank you, Alex. I hope everyone can hear me okay. We and can, hello then. to the high schools. It's really nice to have this chance to talk to you. Uh, again, my name is Lynn Trahey. I'm not from Illinois. I'm from Pennsylvania. I got my bachelor's degree in Syracuse University in New York. Then I went to Berkeley for my PhD in chemistry. So all along, I've been interested in chemistry, and this led to a postdoctoral appointment at Northwestern University, and then finally a job here at Argonne National Laboratory where I work on lithium ion battery chemistry. Uh, it's actually a big part of what we do here. And where I am right now is one of our chemistry labs in the chemical sciences and engineering uh, division here at Argonne. So to first understand about batteries, you're going to have to open up your textbooks to the appendix in the very back. This appendix is the appendix of standard reduction potentials. And I know you've well, I know you have this book, and you know that your book also has this appendix. This appendix is usually affiliated with the electrochemistry chapter earlier in the book. And the importance of this table is that it tells you the reducing power and the oxidizing power of different elements. If you were going to just make a battery spontaneously, you'd want two materials that are very different. And this chart is exactly what tells you that. And the most significant thing for lithium ion battery researchers on here is the fact that lithium ions, Li plus plus one electron going to lithium metal, is a very negative number on this table. It does not want to go in that direction. Lithium would prefer to be in the ionized state as opposed to the solid state. So because lithium is so far down this table, if you pit that against a material that is discovered at a different part of the table, the complete opposite part of the table, You'll get a high voltage battery, and that's what we're after in rechargeable batteries for <laughs> consumer applications, consumer electronics, and electric vehicles. All right, so that's the importance of that table, but what's really happening in a battery is reduction and oxidation, often called redox. Uh, reduction is when something gains an electron, and oxidation is when something loses an electron. And this is the pivotal part of what we do in a battery. We are causing chemical reactions of oxidation and chemical reactions of reduction uh, in the battery simultaneously. And to do that, we, uh, as a chemist, would think about anodes and cathodes. The anode is could be lithium metal in a battery, but it's not because that's not quite as safe as graphite. And then there's also the cathode part of the battery. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what a cathode is. A uh, cathode traditionally in a lithium ion battery is uh, a lithium metal oxide. This here is a, a ball and stick diagram or three dimensional model, which is sort of like a, a Lewis dot structure turned into a Vesper model, turned into a three dimensional model that you're holding in your hands of one of the cathode materials that could be inside of a battery and that probably is inside of your battery in your phone or your laptop right now. And uh, the significance of this is that we look for materials where lithium can slide in and out of. Uh, that's called intercalation. If it intercalates into the structure and out of the structure, and the structure remains relatively stable, that's really important for having a battery that lasts a long time. So for cathode research as a chemist, what you're doing is you're looking for new materials that have that ability and that also have a reduction potential and an oxidation potential that are far apart from the lithium uh, reduction potential. On the negative side of the battery, uh, we tend to use graphite. Graphite uh, is uh, it's like C6 rings, and lithium ions go in and out of that structure just like in a lithium metal oxide. It's an intercalation procedure. The research that I would do is to develop new cathodes or new anodes. And a lot of the anodes that we're looking at, the anodes are where all the lithium is, is uh, stored when your battery is fully charged. I'm looking at anode materials that don't have that clean intercalation process. It has a more destructive process. But with that destruction comes much greater energy density. So my job now is to characterize and harness that energy in a battery that you can use for a couple of years at least. Uh, if you were to make a cathode material or an anode material, it would actually just look like a black powder. It's not that fun to look at. But this is what they look like when they're fully laminated in a battery. So this one here, that's copper. The copper current collector, that's always on the anode side. And this one here, that's an aluminum current collector. That's on the positive side. And these are 
casts, these are laminations of the materials that are good anodes and good cathodes. So a bunch of these together make a battery, but only two of them together is what makes a cell. I have some examples of cells here. So I don't make big batteries like are in your cell phone or in your laptop. I'll show you what those guys look like. This is a cylindrical cell. Uh, about four or six of these tend to be inside of your laptop material. And in this case, the anode and the cathode are really wound up. It's called a jelly roll sometimes. In this case, we have a pouch cell. A pouch cell is more the format for your iPad or for your cell phone. And this is just a sandwiching or a stacking of anodes versus cathodes. But like I said, I don't really do that. My job is to put anodes and cathodes into little things called coin cells. This might be hard for you to see. It's about the size of two or three stacked nickels. Inside of this is one anode and one cathode. And I do a lot of uh, electrochemical testing on things just like this size. It's perfectly engineered so that all of the data that I get for how well this performs can be linked to the electrode that I may have made. I'm standing in this room to show you where I might make something like this. Um, this here is a glove box. Hopefully you can see it if we turn the camera a little bit. A glove box for us has these gigantic gloves which always have fingers that are way too big for mine. And inside of this box, which is, uh, contains the element argon, they usually contain argon or helium, something that is inert to your experiment, is where we assemble the coin cell. And why do we do that? Uh, we don't, you don't do that if you're making a battery for your car. And the significance here is that you're making a battery that has lithium metal in it instead. Lithium metal is the ideal anode for your lithium ion battery. It doesn't work very well for long-term cycling because it's not an intercalation process. It's an electrodeposition and a stripping of a, of a metal. And that carries a whole host of its own problems for reversibility. But we do use lithium metal as our counter electrode it, when we're in a coin cell because it's pretty well characterized for the first 30 or 50 cycles of its life. And lithium metal, you don't want to have out in the air. It reacts very slowly with air. It's usually reacting with the moisture and the oxygen um, and the nitrogen. So we don't handle lithium metal out here. For safety reasons, we handle it inside. We also want to keep a lot of oxygen and moisture out of the electrolyte that we use because the electrolyte that we're using in all these lithium ion batteries, it's not water. It's an organic electrolyte. And we try to keep it uh, as water free as possible. So. Glove boxes, safety glasses, gloves, these are some of the safety mechanisms that we use every day when we are assembling things to test um, for the next generation of batteries. Uh, I know other people are going to talk about what happens when someone like me might discover a really great material and how we scale that up, and I will uh, leave it to them, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So, so Lynn, we actually have a question that has come from online um, from a Hamilton Carter. He, he wants to know, um, how are the toxic battery materials being addressed? How are the toxic battery materials being addressed? Correct. Yeah, so some of the materials in a battery can be toxic, uh, just like in a lead acid battery, some of the materials in there can be toxic. Um, you know, I think that the answer is that we contain everything and we understand what's going on. We don't have things that are inherently much more dangerous than are already out there in consumer products. Um, if possible, we minimize cost and toxicity. So we do want materials. We're, we're always balancing. Uh, we want the safest material, and we also want the least toxic material. And if, if a battery is operating normally, the toxic nature of anything inside of it, like whether it be a carcinogenic material or a nanoparticle, the, the hazards inside are totally contained while the battery is operating normally. Um, but mostly what we do is just really close, uh, careful studies and contained atmospheres. Great, great. Thanks very much. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, thank you. So next we're going to send it over to uh, Chris Pupak, um, who's going to kind of tell us about the, the next phase of the, uh, the research. So Chris, if you would, take it away. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to Material Engineering Facility. My name is Chris Pupak, and I am a, a process research and development chemist. I will explain you what process research and development uh, process research and development is and why we need it. But before that, I would like to tell you what education and experience brought me to Argon. 
Uh, I was graduated from Warsaw Technical University in Warsaw, Poland, with degree in uh, chemical uh, technology, PhD degree in chemical technology. After that, I did my uh, uh, I did my postdoctoral assignment in Roche Bioscience in Palo Alto, California. After that, for uh, 17 years, I worked for different uh, pharmaceutical and agrochemical companies, uh, helped them to develop manufacturing processes for different chemicals. And around three years ago, I was hired by Argon specifically for this program, uh, thanks to my extensive industrial experience. So what, what process uh, research and development is and why we need it. As Lynn mentioned, the discovery chemists, they work in the very small scale. Their objective is to make as many new materials as possible and as quickly as possible uh, to test them in the lab, looking for the, the best uh, material they can develop for the advanced batteries. And typically what they are making is a very, very small scale. This is the vial with one gram of material. What kind of material? Uh, electrolytes for lithium ion batteries are a mixture of several components. There is organic solvents, there is a salt that allows electrolytes to conduct electricity, as well as many, many additives that help the battery to perform better. So, <clears throat> there is a because of the scientists, discovery scientists work with so small scale, they use the reagents, instrumentation, and technique that is very, very efficient uh, in the laboratory setting, but would be very difficult uh, or even impossible to implement into the industrial process. And therefore, there is a gap between uh, discovery and commercialization of this great discovery. What process research and development chemists do is helping the discovery scientists push their discoveries further, convert the discovery into the commercial products. In this case, into the battery for electric vehicles. And how we do this? We start our st from the original procedure that was used by the discovery chemists, and we are looking for a red flags what the red flags are. Usually we are looking for something unusual, like extremely toxic reagents, or extremely flammable reagents, or some techniques that we know cannot be, uh, cannot be used in the large-scale manufacturing. Our objective is to develop the process that will yield the best possible material with the lowest possible cost. And we pay special attention to toxicity of the of the uh, reagents. For example, dichloromethane, which is chlorinated solvent, is very efficient in the lab and commonly used in the lab. But because of the toxicity, is not welcome in the industrial scale when the industry operates in the uh, multi-ton quantities. Another good example of what can uh, be run in the lab and cannot be implemented into the industrial setting is the chromatography. If the organic compounds is made in the small quantities, the best way to purify it is through chromatography. But chromatography requires a lot of, a lot of uh, solvents, a lot of energy to evaporate the solvents, and therefore would be extremely costly to implement this material for uh, this technique in the industrial scale. So, once again, what we are looking for is to make the high performance material in lowest possible cost and the best uh, way that is not really, uh, will not affect the environment. Uh, we are looking on how much energy the process will use and how much waste the process will generate. And how we, how we uh, approach our, our problem. On the beginning, we, s we are using very small scale, almost the same scale like, uh, like uh, discovery chemists. This is a reactor that I don't know if you can see it, 
but we can put six test tubes and run six reactions simultaneously. This is a very, very small scale reaction, milliliter scale reaction, and we are looking for the perfect condition for the, for the reaction. What the perfect condition is? We are screening for the best solvent. Best solvent for the, from the industrial point of view is the solvent with the lowest toxicity and lowest flammability. We are looking for parameters like uh, temperature of the reaction and the time of the reaction. If you think about the temperature and time, you think about the energy, how much energy the process will use. And we obviously want to minimize this process. So a lot of, a lot of work in the very, very small scale. And <clears throat> we are, when we develop our new chemistry to make the material, we test it in the around 100 gram scale. So this is jar with the same material as I show you. This is one gram. Typically, the amount uh, made by the discovery chemist, this is around 100 gram. When we made this 100 gram, we validate our process. What means validation, process validation? We run the same process over and over and over several times to make sure that each time the material has exactly the same property. And the standard for battery grade material is very high. The material needs to be very, very, very pure. When we are comfortable that we understand the process, we validate the process, the process is safe and already optimized, we move to this lab, this is so-called kilo scale, uh, scale lab, when we make multiple kilograms of this material. On my uh, left, there is a reaction vessel, which is a 20 liters, it's a double wall jacketed, and the jacket is filled with thermofluid, so we can, we can heat the content of the reaction or cool it depending on, uh, on our needs. From the 20 liters uh, reaction, we can get around a few kilograms of the material. As you know, most, uh, uh, most chemical reactions, reactions are carried out in the solution. So to get the, to get the product out of the solution, we need to evaporate the solvent. And this is the piece of instrument we use to evaporate the solvent. This is so-called rotary evaporation. This big flask is constantly rotating and this instrument is connected to the vacuum. And the liquid, the solvent, make a film inside the uh, wall of the big flask. And this helps uh, very, very quickly evaporate and we recover our product. After this, we have uh, several steps of purification. We use different techniques for purification, like crystallization or distillation, depending on the material. And what we have after that is this amount of the material. This is one of the additives that we had to electrolyze to help the battery live longer and perform much, much better. Once again, this is the amount that discovery scientists are usually making. This is the amount that process chemists are making. Why we need that much of this material? Well, as Lin showed you, the discovery scientists make a very small batteries. In the real life, the batteries are much, much bigger. And this is the actual cell. This is the actual cell for the battery. Around 100 of these cells will go to the electric vehicle battery. So you can imagine that to fill 100 of these cells, a lot of material is needed. So when we make this new material, we we submit this material to various organization like the industrial organization for uh, for full scale testing as well as we give this material to different scientists for the further research thank you Great. very much for your attention and i will be glad to answer any question thanks very much chris so yeah at this time we would like to check back in with the schools um, and see if they have anything to add or have any questions um, I, I know for example Ms. Terry, your class over at Schur's, um, that's, that's an automotive class, correct? Yes, that's correct. 
So, um, is it, is, uh, what, what kind of stuff are you guys working on over there right now? Well, right now we're in the process of uh, working on the prototype of an electric vehicle. It's an ongoing project where we started out with just a just frame, but now we're trying to get the uh, solar panels because we also want solar energy to power the assessments. So we're working on that as how can we make that a project in the, in the reality, but we still have it on the drawing board. Great. Um, how about um, Niles North? Um, do, you, do you guys have anything to add or any questions at this time? Or okay. Um, next, we're, next we're going to send it over to uh, Henning Losa Bush, who's going to um, he's over in our thermal test chamber, and he's going to talk about um, another phase of the process. So, uh, hey, hey there, Henning. Henny, I think your uh, I think your mic is muted. There All you right. go. We can hear there you. There we now. go. All right. Thanks, yeah. Alex. Sure. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm actually I guess at the other end of this chain where Lynn talked about making very small batches of um, material for batteries. Chris talked about scaling it up, and behind me I have a uh, full size battery electric vehicle in our test chamber here. Um, but first, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, about probably 10 or 15 years ago, I was exactly where you're sitting. Well, not physically, but, you know, state of life. Um, and I had a pretty good time in high school, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. As a matter of fact, I remember a guidance counselor asking me if I had thought about what comes after high school. And I, I, I kid you not, I was floored about that question, didn't quite didn't quite realize that there was something after that. I guess I had too good of a time in high school. Um, I did know that I liked cars, and uh, when I was much younger, uh, I loved playing with Legos. So I, I figured maybe this engineering thing could work out, and I was really lucky that uh, my parents made it possible for me to go to college, and I uh, went around and looked to uh, a lot of the uh, different uh, engineering faculty, talked with professors, and figured, yeah, that's what I really wanted to do. Um, and as I went through college, I was uh, able to join a, uh, a student team there that was working on hybrid cars. This is well over a decade ago, so that was brand new stuff at the time, and uh, was very exciting to me. And uh, I really had an epiphany while I was there. Um, all these equations that you learn in your textbook, so what Lynn was showing you in the back of that giant book, well, they actually work out to be useful. <laughs> so when I was working on the team, we built a car, and I made some power calculations and energy calculations and came up with efficiency numbers. And I realized, yes, this is all working out. We designed something. It didn't work the first time, but the second time, it actually worked out to come through numbers that made sense, efficiencies that made sense. And uh, it was just an awesome moment where I realized that all these years were useful to me in the end. And through that, I came to Argonne National Lab. And um, while I was here, I was able to use my research to do my PhD. And I'm still here because I love what I do so much. So let me tell you a little bit about what I do and where we are. We're in the Advanced Powertrain Research Facility. And right behind me, you have a car that sits on an engine down a chassis dynamometer. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But what you see, basically, is the larger scale version of what uh, Link and Chris have showed you earlier. This car is basically moved by an electric motor and a really large battery pack that allows it to drive down the road. This makes for a rather efficient combination, really. And let me talk a little bit more about this scale-up process. There's really two directions in terms of batteries you can go. You can make more power, or you can add more energy. So what's power? What's energy? I do hope that through these giant textbooks, you've been able to learn that already. But let me try to give you a, a quick summary. So typically, I would ask at this point, how much power does it take for a car to drive 60 miles an hour down the interstate, say a minivan? So I'll give you two or three seconds here to think that answer in your head. I hope you have a number. All right, the answer is 15 horsepower. That is all it takes to drive on a flat road down the highway at uh, 60 miles an hour. Well, why do cars have 200 horsepower? Hell, you can even buy a minivan that has 300 horsepower. That seems, something seems off. So think about the answer of why do you need horsepower? 
Good. I hope you have it. All right. The answer is so that you can accelerate really fast. Uh, some people like to burn tires on cars uh, because there's so much power that you can do that. And so the scale-up process really works in these two dimensions, scaling up the power and scaling up the energy. And you need both for these electric cars. You need enough power to move a full-size car that's a few thousand pounds in weight, and then you need enough energy to be able to drive it for a reasonable distance, 100 miles or so. So those two components really go into the uh, scale-up of uh, this type of vehicle. So what's at the other spectrum of an electric car? It's a normal car. And uh, a normal car would be a car like probably your parents have right now, which has an internal combustion engine and a transmission. And um, let me try to give you a little bit of an example here. Um, I'm guessing you all ride bicycles where you pedal around. Um, well, a conventional car, you're the engine, and then you have a transmission. So those are the gears that you select on your bike. And um, the more gears you have, the easier you can make it on yourself. The harder you pedal, the more power you need. And this relates to the battery scale-up, actually. If you pedal really, really hard in a race, you might not be able to ride 20, 40 miles. If you take a more leisurely pace, even though it might take you longer, well, you have more energy over the whole time, and you can get um, to a point where you cover more distance, even if it takes a little longer. Well, a conventional car is just that. And you're limited by the selection of the gears. When you take a um, conventional car and you add an electric motor and a battery, you can have what's called a hybrid. Now you can actually disconnect the engine from what the wheels need and what you as a driver demand when you hit the accelerator pedal, and uh, you can run that engine a lot more efficiently. So to stick with the bike analogy, uh, imagine that you were on a stationary bike and you just pedal all the time at the same speed, very relaxed, very, very leisurely. Uh, and you make power all the time, and you get to store that. And so when a big hill comes, your friend that's pedaling on a real bike, they would have to pedal really hard to get up that hill. Well, you can just keep pedaling at the same speed because you just stored a lot of energy on your stationary bike. Oh, and then the other great news is when it goes back down the hill, well, you can use that energy, that potential energy that is in the car or in you when you bike and store it back in your batteries as well. So those components allow for some really efficient operation and for an electric car. And on a hybrid, it allows you to run the engine very efficiently. That's why your fuel economy goes up dramatically. You get this thing that's called regenerative braking. So that's when the car comes to a stop. You can put energy back into the batteries and... Uh, finally, there's come some smaller pieces like when you're at a stop, the engine doesn't run. When it doesn't run, it doesn't use fuel. That helps tremendously with your fuel consumption. The final piece I wanted to talk to you guys about is how cars are tested. Um, so we're standing here in a chassis dynamometer test cell, and if you look closely, you can see that the car, and you can probably see it right at the front there, the wheel is sitting on a giant steel roll, and that steel roll is actually, call it a treadmill for cars. It replicates the exact same power that the car would have to use to drive on a road, but here in a room. And now you can do a very controlled experiment. So uh, you can repeat the exact same speed pattern over time, one for city type driving, one for highway type driving, and there's different flavors of it. And you can say, this car gets that fuel economy on this drive cycle. Um, my parents always used to say that the fuel economy that you read on the little sticker at the dealership is something that you never get and that's measured going down the hill with wind in the back. Well, not really. It's actually measured right here on a chassis dynamometer like this. We measure the fuel that's used over a drive cycle and then you have some of these newer cars that are electric cars. Here we measure the electricity and we actually have a couple of power analyzers in the background there that allow us to measure that electric flow. And then finally, there is uh, another type of cars that we really haven't talked about that's combining a hybrid car and a battery electric car. If you put those two together, now you have a car that can drive on electricity for a certain distance. And then once you're out of electricity, you can actually use the internal combustion engine with fuel and dri keep driving. One of the challenges that is still out there with some of these battery technologies is how quickly you can fill up 
um, the cars, which is why we're still doing research and we're still looking into those items. Uh, but just to give you an idea, when you charge currently on an electric car, you can charge at home up to six kilowatts maybe. Well, when you're at the fuel station and you fill up your car, you're actually putting 22 megawatts of fuel in terms of power transfer into that tank. That's why lots of power allow you to put energy in a tank fairly quickly. And with batteries, with your reduced charge power, it takes a little bit longer, which is probably okay because most people have cars sitting in their garage overnight. And so you have a long time to charge these batteries up. So um, I think that's it for, uh, for all that I had to say. So uh, I'll be curious on your questions. So um, thanks very much, Henning. I know that uh, Schur's High School has a question that would be uh, more geared towards um, either perhaps uh, Lynn or Chris. So um, if you would like to ask your question, Schur's. Well, hello, my name is uh, Alex Ortega from Cabo, my school shares. Yeah, how many, how many batteries can you make by, by those materials that you're making? Uh, actually, I don't make the uh, actual cells. We make the material and we submit the material to uh, industrial partners or to other researchers to make the actual cells and test them. But uh, this particular compound with this additive to the um, electrolytes and this goes around 10 percent. Only 10 percent of the electrolytes is this material. So this is two kilograms of the material and this would be for a hundreds and hundreds of this uh, this type of cells. So, so th mean... there is enough material for full scale industrial uh, testing and validation of this material. So did, did that answer your question, Schurz, or um, were you looking for the actual n number of batteries that would be? Yeah. Um, and, and so meaning when each of the thing you just grabbed, the white stuff, that's like the material you guys use to make battery or test battery? Chris, did you hear the question? Uh, actually, I didn't get it. The, the, the material that you just held up, the, the container with the white. Um, yes. So that, that goes into the actual cells, and then there's several cells within a battery, is that correct? Or? Yes, it is correct. And so how this, many? Am, this amount of, of material, which is two kilograms in this jar, is enough for several hundreds of cells. And how many, how many uh, batteries can you produce from several hundred cells? Uh, it depends on the battery, but average uh, car battery is around 100 of these cells, so it is good for uh, a handful of batteries maybe yes yes okay. definitely at least 10 okay great i hope that answers your question sure yeah that answers my question okay great thanks for your question um does any anybody from uh, now's north have a question at this time no oh, okay can you hear us? We can, yep. Oh, that chair is right there. there. Yeah, there you go, so they can see it. You might want to sit. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, the guy by the car. So are there any, <laughs> are there any environmental drawbacks to using electric cars? Just like, you know, how we use, like, gas. Henning, did you catch that? You're muted again. I, I think I got the question. Um, was it specifically to electric cars? Yeah. Okay, that's 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 actually a really good question. Um, they're different. So the question is really, where does your electricity come from? And so, um, if you look at it from the perspective of you just go home and charge it here in Illinois, you actually get a fair bit of electricity from coal. And so that has a lot of um, upstream greenhouse gas effects. Uh, but if you, say, uh, at home have a large uh, solar panel, and that solar panel is connected to a battery storage system in your home, and that's what you use to recharge your car, then you could actually 
really lessen that impact. Or even across the country, if you plug a car in in California, it's going to be cleaner than if you plug in your car, say, here in Illinois. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, actually, it did, Henning. And we actually have one other question that comes from um, Ms. Terry um, over at Shures. She wants to know whether um, rolling resistance goes into the measurements. Ah, yes. Um, yes, roll, absolutely. Rolling resistance does go into uh, the measurements. So uh, the way the dynamometer that I was shown earlier um, simulates the exact force at the wheel that the car would experience out on the road is uh, by the fact that we input parameters into a computer. And that computer basically calculates what that force is at every single point in time. And the, the two things, really, that we put in is, one is the mass of the vehicle. So that is the inertia you have to accelerate. And the uh, other component is what we call road load. And the road load includes rolling resistance, as well as the aerodynamic forces, anything that really opposes the direction of travel from a physics standpoint. And so it's most definitely included. It gets a little tricky and interesting, though, um, because the tire, as it sits on the dynamometer, still has a rolling resistance, but there's no wind that slows the car down. So we actually have to figure out, before we test the car, what forces are still present on the car, and then eliminate those from the calculations that the dynamometer does in order to simulate the right force at the wheel. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, great. Thank you, Henning. It looks like we have another question from uh, Niles North High School. So if you're uh, ready when you are. So I have a question. So um, what, we, what would you think is better, having a gas car or having electric car, and which one lasts longer? I'm, sure. I'm guessing this question is for me again. Yeah. Um, yes. You know, it depends. It, it's really not a black and white issue. Uh, so the good news is we have a lot of different technologies that are available for us to use. And um, I'll just give you an example. If you live in the city and you're covering short distances and you don't really need that much space, an electric car is a great solution for you. Um, frankly, due to rules and regulations, we expect these battery vehicles to last very long. If the early hybrids are any indication on it, um, the batteries actually last for a phenomenal time, actually longer than expected on the early hybrids. Uh, on the opposite side, though, what if, uh, for example, a colleague of mine, he commutes 120 miles a day, and he does so on the highway. Well, he might be better off with a, um, a diesel vehicle that has a manual transmission. That engine operates very efficiently. The manual transmission doesn't lose much power along the way, so it's a great setup for him. And then in between, you have all these different options. Even within hybrids, there are different flavors that work better for how you use it. Uh, so a plug-in hybrid, for example, is great if you drive shorter or very predictable distances every day uh, within a 40-mile range, but then you know that regularly you want to drive 300 miles to go to Detroit, for example. Then a plug-in hybrid is a great candidate for you. So it really depends on how you drive what the best car might be for you and what the Im impact might be in general uh, for your wallet as well as sort of the society at large and the environment. So um, we're, we're getting close to the time that we have to cut it off. We have to be respectful of um, uh, both classes, uh, bell schedules, but um, do, do we want to give the both schools another opportunity. Um, any, anything else from uh, Shures at this time uh, for uh, either for Lynn or Chris or Henning again or? Um. Yes, uh, Shures has one more question. Okay. For Mr. Bork. Okay. Uh, we have a student. He's going to ask you a question regarding the car bag. Okay. Uh, my name is Renee. Uh, and I wanted to know if the car battery, is, uh, if it's possible to do, be used in trucks. Also, like uh, it requires like more power. Um, Lynn, do you want to take a shot at that? Do we be able to catch what he said? I could you repeat the question, Alex? Um, sure. I, I think the question was the applicability of, um, of batteries towards trucks instead of just cars, and what would be different? Oh. 
Well, I don't know. Penning can probably answer that a little bit better than me. Uh, trucks have different requirements than cars. They probably need a little bit more power. If you, if I needed to design a small battery that had more power, there are tricks I could play and uh, structures I could use that could give me greater power. And that's one of my research goals. But that is not necessarily being translated to the truck market yet. Henning, could you maybe finish off yeah. this question? Yeah. No, and and you bring you just you had it exactly right. So there's more power requirements, and if you look at the long distance truck, I don't think it makes sense at this point, uh, because of the amount of time it would take to charge the battery. So this is an energy question for the trucks long distance, long haul. But actually, there's some programs in California where they're using electric trucks that really have a larger battery in the sense of more power to bring containers from a harbor to a different location. So it's very local, short distances, so much power required, but not much energy, relatively speaking, required to move those trucks. So that's that's absolutely a great question. And you know, frankly, there's still a lot of challenges open out there, and a lot this discovery still to be made in all of these different fields that enable transportation and electrification. And I really hope that you guys can come join us and make a difference. Thanks, thanks very much, Henning. So yeah, like I said, we're, we're, we're getting close up to when the two schools have to, to move on. So um, uh, Anna's going to um, you know, kind of wrap things up and talk a little bit about what we saw. Um, but uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. So, so I just wanted to send my thanks uh, to the students for your attention today and also for the opportunity to share with you some of our transportation research here. Uh, obviously, the pathway for vehicle electrification takes, as Henning mentioned, you know, batteries and electric motors and everything from the discovery and invention all the way up to the scale up and then the application into the vehicles. Our goals is certainly to get beyond the 75 or 100 mile range that we have in, in battery electric vehicles today and get more similar to what you might experience from a conventional vehicle where we have a 350 mile range or thereabouts which does take some additional discovery and invention on the battery side as well as uh, some more research on the fast charging side. Um, so I, I would like to encourage you to continue to study math and science because there's a great need in this country and around the world uh, for additional scientists and engineers as we're trying to move towards that doubling the fuel economy and reducing our petroleum use from transportation. So with that, maybe a, a closing word from Alex, and then I, I really do appreciate your attention today. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for your time, all those who um, are tuned in um, you know, across the country and um, in other parts of the world. And uh, thanks very much to the, the two classes for um, taking time. Um, you know, we'll say uh, goodbye to Shares again. Thanks very much, guys. Um, and we'll say uh, bye to Niles North as well. Thank you very much. And. Um, uh, of course, you can find us on Google+. Plus. Um, you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter. Um, we really like to you know, interact with you guys as much as possible, learn from you. And um, uh, we'll be doing more of these uh, uh, Hangout-type events in the future. So uh, please stay tuned in, and we look forward to uh, uh, keeping in touch with you. So thanks very much. Have a good rest of your day, and uh, take care.